Hey everybody, in 1930 there was a serial killer in Cleveland, Ohio. He was known as the Torso Killer. It even included the great Elliot Ness investigating this case. This is going to be an interesting court TV segment. I hope that you'll take a moment and watch closely as this thing unfolds. Think about a couple of things, Sweeney Todd or Jack the Ripper. It's going to be interesting. Welcome back to Closing Arguments. Time to open up tonight's unsolved case file. And this one, we go way back to the 1930s. It's a case uh, that Elliot Ness actually worked on. Notorious serial killer back in the 30s in Cleveland, Ohio. The Torso Killer. Uh, WEWS, our great affiliate, and Homer Bash, uh, incredible journalist, have the story. It is one of the darkest chapters in Cleveland history. Tom was uh, in, in fear. And during that time, a serial killer stalked this city. When the serial killers are out, they were all afraid. A brutal killer who inspired dozens of books and blogs. He always took the head off. The torso murderer claimed at least a dozen victims from 1934 to 1938. Sometimes he dissected them more than that. Most of the killings concentrated in an area called Kingsbury Run. These days, it's better known as the area near the flats. Uh, he was non-discriminatory, killed black, white, women, men. Interestingly, he tended to leave the men intact. But the women, he cut up in smaller pieces. Don't know why. The coroner at the time said that the murderer probably could do a better job than half of his staff in dismembering a corpse. Out of the 12 official victims, only two were ever truly identified. But all of the victims had one thing in common. People who would not be missed, people who had no identity. In the pages of Cleveland's history, this was the city's first serial killer. The duel, if you will, between the torso killer and Elliot Ness was just a fascinating bit of history. It even brought the famed cop Elliot Ness to Cleveland to take over as public safety director. Ness, best known for taking down gangster Al Capone. But the torso killer wouldn't be as easy to catch. The pressure to find someone, anyone, was so intense. For years, the killer taunted Ness, sending letters and postcards. He even admitted it to Elliot Ness in one of the postcards, sort of. This one, signed the American Sweeney. Some believe it's a reference to Sweeney Todd, a fictional serial killer in Britain. So the fact that he would call himself the American Sweeney is the kind of joke he would love to play. And the true nature of the torso killer's crimes, a mystery within a mystery. The official police file disappeared. It's gone. No one can say exactly when or how it happened, but it's gone. It's why so much of today's knowledge about it is reconstructed from documents and newspapers, from people's memories. There's no sense of closure, not for the families of the victims and not for the public, because we'll just never know. But even though investigators could never claim to have caught the killer, Dr. Badal says his years of research brought him to a single conclusion. Who do I think did it? It was Dr. Francis Edward Sweeney. Uh, a skilled surgeon who fell into alcoholism and drug addiction, uh, lapsed into paranoid schizophrenia. A city gripped in fear, a dozen faceless victims. I'm 99% sure we pegged him. And the belief that this face, this man, is Cleveland's torso killer. Francis Edward Sweeney, nothing points away from him. All right, folks, maybe, just maybe, you have some information? If you do, 216-252-7463. That's the number to call. Uh, still with me tonight, retired FBI Special Agent Bobby Chacon and retired police commander, host of the Profiling Evil podcast, Mike King. And joining us now by phone in Cleveland, Ohio, the author of In the Wake of the Butcher, Cleveland's Torso Murders, 
Dr. James Badal is with us. Uh, Dr. Badal, I'll begin with you. Thanks so much for uh, joining us tonight. Um, explain to us why you are so convinced that it was Sweeney. Well, primarily because nothing points away from him. All the circumstantial ev evidence points to him. Uh, in, and I'm a little bit unsure about the year now, but Elliot, one of Elliot Ness's uh, most trusted associates, David Gulls, gave an interview to the first director of the Cleveland Police Historical Society Museum. And when he was asked about the Torso Killer, he said, we had a suspect. I don't want to mention any names, but... And the description he gave was so complete that it was obviously he was talking about uh, Dr. Edward Francis Sweeney. Let me, and, and, and there is no way to forensically tie him to any of these murders? Not at this point, I wouldn't think. Uh, of course, back in the 1930s, they had no idea what DNA was. They were also operating on the assumption that people were murdered by other people that they knew for understandable reasons, reasons like greed, jealousy, anger, whatever. Uh, most of the body parts that were recovered were either returned to family, if there was any family. They were either buried in a pauper's grave some of them were sent to the medical school at Western Reserve University. And I think some wound up at the Natural History Museum. So there is just simply nothing left to even test. Mike King, host of Profiling Evil, let me ask you this. Do we have killers like this anymore? Killers who will taunt uh, the investigators who are trying to track them down? Oh, I, absolutely. I mean, even you, you go back just a few years with, with the recent conviction of Dennis Rader, BTK, uh, in Wichita, Kansas, who taunted police for years, who taunted the media. Uh, this is part of that sadistic mindset, and they get a, a sense of control and thrill out of taunting and letting law enforcement and the public know that they are smarter than them. Bobby Chacon, the great Elliot Ness, on the case. Are you surprised that there was no arrest made by the, by the man who I watched growing up on The Untouchables, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised because, you know, from what they were working with, these people were on the fringe of society. They were, you know, so, you, you know, he was picking off people that weren't going to be missed. So there might have been a delay in when the bodies were found. Um, and, and you just didn't have the technology that we have today that would have tested the wounds, how they were dismembered, the things like that. Um, they did a great job, and I, and I give so much credit to Dr. Badal, um, to, to basically kind of find this guy. I, I, I probably believe the theory um, put forth tonight, and and because um, I was thinking even before Dr. Badal uh, posited his theory that, you know, it sounds like someone that's familiar with anatomy um, could be a doctor, could be a morgue worker, or things like that. And so, you know, the, the, the suspect fits right in, and, and certainly, as Dr. Vidal said, you know, when you put people into a pool and nothing points out, then they stay in that pool when nothing points away from them. That's very, to me, that's very, very strong circumstantial evidence. Uh, Dr. Vidal, before we go, do we know if, if, if Sweeney has any relatives that are, are still around? And, and uh, have they ever commented on any of this? Uh, there is no one in Cleveland with the last name of Sweeney who is directly related to him. Uh, he did have two children. As far as I know, neither one produced offspring. Uh, he had a couple of brothers, both of whom who died. So anyone related to him is descended from one of his sisters. Uh, there are people in Cleveland who are very distantly related to him, but they do not have the last name of Sweeney. And if I may comment on what the FBI gentleman just said, if uh, Elliot Ness did identify Francis Sweeney, he simply had no evidence against him. And if he had taken him to court, he would have been judged insane. 
and are found innocent by guilty of, of by reason of insanity. And so, I think something was arranged. Uh, not exactly a smoky back room thing, but something was arranged to get him off the streets and into the Sandusky Sailors and Veterans Home, uh, which would then protect uh, his immediate family. Unbelievable story. Dr. James Bedal, uh, in the wake of the butcher, Cleveland's torso murders. Thank you so much. Bobby Chacon, Mike King, always great to have you on the show. Uh, appreciate your expertise and insight. Well, I want to thank Vinny Paulton and the entire Court TV for the chance to be on this segment. Also, Dr. James Padal, who's put, put an entire lifetime into investigating this case. Make sure you check out his book. And I want to thank Bobby Chacon. This has been an interesting segment. I hope you'll take a moment, hit the like and the subscribe button, and ring that bell so that you get notified of our other events like this one as we release them. And we'll see you soon at the next crime scene. Thank you.